Luke and chapter 2. Having said that, verse 25. I was, uh, I was torn about the, the title of this sermon, whether to call it, call it Pieces or Powder or The Price of Revival. 25 through 35 responsibly. I read verse 25. You read verse 26. Luke 2. Behold, there's a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. He came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, after the custom of the law. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Simeon blessed him and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. I want to consider a number of thoughts with you from this passage of Scripture. First of all, I'd like to consider with you the commission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are living in, a, in a, an era of a tremendous question that's going out over all the earth of what approach shall we use in the presentation of the gospel message and in winning people to the kingdom of God. There's a tremendous question being asked concerning that, and there's a tremendous temptation today to uh, give painless birth to children in the kingdom of God. We'd like to get people saved, but we want some painless method of doing that. And so we're hearing all kinds of, of, uh, of propositions and all kinds of doctrines and all kinds of uh, precepts uh, that, are being, uh, that are being furthered. Uh, one of the most popular t television ministers has a very large church in South, uh, uh, South, uh, Southern California. He says, I never preach on anything controversial. Vance Havner, one of the old-time men of God that's had tremendous impact in our generation, he said, on the other hand, every time I go to the pulpit, I go with the sure knowledge I will upset someone. But that does not deter me. If you come in here and I tell you something that you're wanting to hear, friend, your flesh is not to be mollified and to be, and to be massaged into the kingdom of God, but the Bible says that our approach is to preach the word of God. One of these fellows said, there's no way we can, he's talking about the presentation of the gospel, we can get their ear unless we tell the truth and appeal to their dignity in the process rather to insult or slander them in style and strategy. If I violate the self-respect, the self-dignity, the personhood, the self-worth of any person, no matter what my goal may be, if I have to insult them to try to convert them, that's a sinful strategy of evangelism. By insulting, he's talking about calling sin, sin. I don't know of anybody that deliberately preaches the gospel that goes out and finds somebody to insult. I wonder what he would have said of John the Baptist when he was standing on the riverbank preaching. Who, when all the religious people began to come to him, said to them, if you want me to baptize you, you bring forth evidences of repentance. Uh, he said, what I think you are, are a bunch of snakes. Read it in the Bible. It's in there. I haven't ever done that yet. <laughs> when
When the religious people started getting excited in Jesus' day, he said to them, the, the words, the very opening statement recorded in the Word of God of Jesus is repent, quit living like you're living. And he said to the religious folk, you're like a bunch of graves, you're full of dead men's bones, you're whitewashed on the outside, but inside you're full of degeneration and decay and rottenness, and, and, and you would smell awful. And I have never done that yet. But we have an interesting statement here in the commission of the gospel in this passage of scripture that we have before us, and that is as the baby Jesus was brought to the temple to be dedicated after the Jewish law and presented in dedication to God. Simeon, who was a man full of the Holy Ghost, Spirit of God comes upon him. He has a revelation from God that this is the salvation of Israel. He begins to prophesy, and these words come out of his mouth. He says that the commission of the gospel will be to instigate a response from human hearts that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And he looks at Mary, and he says to Mary, And a sword shall pierce through your own soul also. In other words, there's a synonymous term used. He's saying that what is going to happen in the, in the testimony, in the events involving this child, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is that his coming into the world is going to be like humanity being sliced open with a sword and exposed inside. And he says to Mary, even though you're his mother, you are not going to escape this either, and even you are going to experience it, this tremendous thing that's going to happen through this child. There is going to be a spiritual work done that will be like God cleaving you wide open and exposing the inner secrets of your being so that he can heal you and bring you wholeness because the gospel, friend, is to indicate, instigate a response. And our commission is not to make people feel comfortable, but to preach this word, and this word causes a sword to pierce into the inner region of human hearts. You see, there are many people today that want salvation without brokenness or the surrender of their lives or repentance in their soul. They would like to have salvation. In other words, they want to make heaven their home. They would like to have the peace, the freedom, the cleansing from guilt that goes by that. They would like to have an overcoming life. They'd like to have power to overcoming sin, but they're unwilling to be broken to bring that to pass. And so the gospel is a commission that is given to you and I to proclaim. And when we proclaim the gospel of this child, that Simeon laid his eyes on, who was the son of the living God, who went on to become the, the Savior crucified for the sins of the world. When we proclaim him automatically, there's something happens in human response, and ours is to bring that response by preaching faithfully what the Word declares. In Matthew's Gospel, the 21st chapter, and the 20, uh, 44th verse, Jesus himself had a tremendous statement to make, uh, and he proclaimed this. He says concerning himself, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. He's talking about no way out for the human race. There is no way that you and I are going to come in contact with the Son of the living God and be the same. Either we will fall upon it and be broken before God to receive in repentance forgiveness and everlasting life, or by coming in contact with Jesus Christ, we will be judged for our sin and our iniquity, but there's no escape for the human race. There's no way out for planet Earth. One or the other is going to happen, and this uh, is the message uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and Jesus said it's either powder or pieces. We can take our choice. See, he makes a tremendous statement there. See, truth, beloved, is a two-edged sword. When we preach the truth, everybody is not happy. This is why Vance Havner said, when I preach a sermon, I know with a certainty that I'm going to upset some people. Some people need to be upset. 
I've been upset by what's in this book. I've been upset when I've heard this book preached. But thank God, as I have listened and opened, it has brought me deliverance and healing and wholeness and has brought blessing into my life because it is a two-edged sword. This sword cuts to deliverance, but this sword cuts to judgment. It is a two-edged sword. And wherever the gospel is preached concerning this child, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, there is a polarization that automatically happens. People are for or people are against. And Jesus Christ is set, Simeon said, for the fall of many. That's a tremendous statement. That word means ruin. This is especially true concerning religious people. This is especially what happened to people who are religious but are not saved, who are religious but will not live for God, who are religious but do not want to obey the book. This especially happens to them. Something happens, and Simeon declared by the Spirit of God that there will be the fall of many, the ruin of many people. It's not talking about the same people that fall, that are the ones that rise that we'll speak about later on. He's talking about something that happens uh, that is their eternal judgment because the gospel is going to bring that to pass. You see, in the preaching of the gospel, there's a tremendous thing that happens. It's not talking about just simply making them feel bad. It's not talking about simply upsetting them for a moment. It's talking about something that happens uh, that unless we will fall upon that stone uh, and be broken in pieces in repentance, uh, that there's going to be the complete ruin uh, that will be our eternal and our final ruin if we do not find uh, in this book uh, the secret of repentance uh, and the lining up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. John 3.19 the Spirit says through the Apostle, and this is the condemnation. What is it? That light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. This word uh, condemnation is a word that is a process of separation. It's a word that has to do with a tribunal. That as they stand before a tribunal, there is something spoken that from that moment separates them and sends them on a path uh, whose end uh, will be eternal judgment and destruction. And John the Apostle said, this is what is happening with the preaching of Jesus Christ. Not that he came into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came. He came into the world that the world through him might be saved. But he says, this is the condemnation that light is come into the world but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Immediately when we preach this word, it brings a, an effect. We either are polarized for God or against God. We'll never be the same. That process transpires instantly because in all true gospel preaching, there's a polarization. In all true gospel preaching, there is a visitation. There is a presence of God God comes on the scene and his presence is operative in all true gospel preaching that brings that effect either for or against and in a true preaching service that transpires people are never the same. When the angels went down to Sodom God knew what was going on at Sodom. He did not go down there to find out whether they were in filth and perversion. He knew they were in filth and perversion. But he sent the angels of the Lord there, and he says this to Abraham, to see if they will indeed respond that way when there is a visible manifestation of God's presence in that place so that he can seal their final judgment and he will have a record for eternity that this is the way they acted in the light of a visible and a present manifestation. They gave a response and this is what the gospel preaching does and this is what Jesus Christ came to perform and this is what true gospel preaching always produces. Jesus said to Jerusalem, 
As he sat on the hill, looked down upon it, and wept over that city, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen does gather her chicks, but you would not. Therefore your house is left unto you desolate, because you know not the hour of your visitation. There's the word that we're talking about, and the fact the visitation is the episcopus. It is the visitation or that presence of God manifested to measure response against the genuine ministering of God's divine presence. And Simeon said that this is what Jesus is going to bring to pass, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You say, don't you think thoughts are revealed? Nah. You can come in a congregation. Some people are smiling piously. And all the time, there's daggers in their heart. We have that capability. But make no mistake, the gospel brings that revelation. See, there are many people who are religious. There are many people who have religious persuasion. But how they genuinely are inside is dependent on how they react when a real presence of divine anointing comes in, when Jesus Christ is presented in the reality of the Word declared. How do they respond to that? Tells me where they are with God spiritually. It's not how we appear outwardly. It's not how many memberships to churches we have. It's not how many times we've been baptized. It's not uh, all the things that we count as religiosity. It's not how many times we come to church. Going to church no more makes you a Christian than going into a chicken house makes you a chicken. It's how you respond to the Word of God that is proclaimed uh, that tells me, and the Bible says that the commission of the gospel is uh, that Jesus Christ uh, is to be presented in His simplicity from the Word, uh, and out of that commission, our commission is simply to present, uh, and there is the thoughts of many hearts that are revealed out of that presentation. Can you say amen? Secondly, I want to consider with you the cost of the gospel. And our generation does not like that sound. Amen? Well, you're just really, really quiet about that. <laughs> get any bad publicity in the local paper? You'd be astounded how many people just get really nervous. The reason they get nervous is their neighbors start talking about it. It's like Mary, who's who's her, her employer is asking her these questions. Says, you still smoke, Mary? Because she used to be a, a suck those coffin nails till a, she smelled for a block away. And he knew it. But he hasn't seen her since she got saved. And so he's, he doesn't want anybody that smokes. He says, you still smoke? He said, no, I got saved and, and got delivered. And right away he got nervous. And he said, do you go to that church? Or, yeah, that's where I go. <laughs> Why was he saying that? Because he's heard all kinds of things about the churches she goes to. This makes a lot of people nervous when their neighbors get upset. See, a lot of new converts get saved, and, uh, and they hear the gospel, and, oh, it's wonderful. They get saved. Glory to God. They're so happy. And they go and tell their friends, and this happened to me. I remember 24 years ago, and I got saved. I was so happy. I didn't know anything about religion. Man, I'm totally ignorant. I'm a modern heathen. Churches to me meant nothing. And, uh, and, uh, and so I got saved. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, I, the, and so there was a, one of my friends that I witnessed to, and uh, there's a young couple, and said, uh, you got saved? Oh, yeah, I got saved. Said, uh, where'd you get saved? See, they, they knew us and never did witness to us. There's Baptists all their lives. Quit. I'm so sure that there's some Baptists that are saved. Thank God for them. But these weren't. They smoked, drank, crowd, just like we did. So right away they got religious. Say, so what church? The Four Square Gospel Church. What kind of church is that? Well, oh, it's a Pentecostal. Is that one of those holy roller churches? I said, ah, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> Didn't matter to me. But I could feel that reproach that was brought in the gospel and there are perhaps new converts in here this, e this morning that as you're in here and you're telling people, what kind of church is that? I, said, I don't know, but boy, I got saved. 
So what do they do? Ah, oh, man, they have prayer service and praising people speaking, speaking in tongues. Oh, that's bad. Bad, huh? Yeah, that's bad. Man, it felt good to me. Yeah, but that's bad. And so immediately comes the social peer pressure of the reproach that's brought on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's a cost to the gospel. Acts, the 28th chapter, the prophet said, For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. your church spoken again? If it isn't, why did it change from the book of Acts church? Because the Bible says that believers in the book of Acts everywhere it was spoken against. When did your church begin to be popular and accepted and socially accepted by all of society and everybody's happy about your church? Why isn't it like the one in the book of Acts uh, where they tell rumors and lies and slander against the pastor and against the people and against everything they're doing? When did it change between uh, uh, the book of Acts, the 28th chapter, and 1979? It hasn't changed at all, friend. But we're in a freebie generation that does not like uh, anything that costs. We want freedom without having to go to war. We want gratification that comes in the sexual realm without commitment to marriage. Amen. You could have said amen. You missed a good place to say amen. We want every service that can possibly come to us in life. We want all kinds of, of benefits uh, and, and, uh, and et cetera without higher taxes or inflation. We want that. Because this is a freebie generation that does not like the cost that's involved with anything in life. But my friend, there's a cost to this gospel that comes out of this book, uh, and you need to, to understand that this cost is spelled out in the Bible, and we see it in these verses of Scripture. Listen very carefully to what I'm saying. Simeon prophesied by the Spirit of God and says concerning this child, Jesus Christ, it is a sign which shall be spoken against. Now this word sign is a word that comes out of archery. And this word literally means a target. This child is for a target that shall be spoken again. Not talking about just casual comments or casual shots that are fired. No, no, that's not what the word means. Talking about a target, dead aim, deliberate attempt. Draw a dead bee. That's what a target is. And anywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, my friend, the true gospel will bring that response anywhere Jesus Christ is exalted, anywhere Jesus Christ is moving, anywhere Jesus Christ is ministering, anywhere Jesus Christ is proclaimed in the simplicity of this book. I'm going to tell you that among that group of people or among that assembly or among that institution, I don't care what it may be, you're going to find that they become a target for the deliberate aim and the shots that are fired from those that are inspired from the pit of hell. And that's a part of the cost of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're wanting into, into a bless me club, you're in the wrong place. Because this place is spoken against. It is not spoken against because God is not saving people. It is not spoken against because there's some evil thing going on here. It is not spoken against because of some uh, violation of human uh, uh, personality or human independence. It is spoken against because Jesus Christ in this place is doing an eternal work. And it is spoken against because people that are inspired from the pit are used of the devil to slander what God is doing in this place. To Herod, friend, Jesus Christ was a target. But to Simeon, he was a beacon. 
One of these two things happens to you and I, according to the attitude of our heart and according to how we stand before God when we hear the gospel and when it is actually proclaimed and we respond, we'll do one of two things. We will either uh, take a shot at it or we will be drawn to it as a beacon, one or the other. There is no middle ground. There's no neutrality in Christianity. He that is not for me, Jesus says, is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters abroad. The 26 translations uh, give several translations of this word, uh, sign, that I'd like to share with you so you understand what I'm saying. One translator says, could translate this, a sign against which hard words will be said. Another translator says, a sign for man's attack. Another translator says, and to set up a standard which, may, which many will attack. Now, I'm not talking about just a passing comment. I'm not talking about a casual, off-the-top-of-the-head comment. I'm talking about a deliberate attempt, a deliberate attack, an inspiration that comes from the pit that takes dead aim and takes a shot at what God is doing in Christ Jesus. And if the devil is not causing this to happen, then there is no gospel being preached in that place. Are you listening to me? If the devil is not stirring up public sentiment against what is happening among an assembly of people, then they are not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because this is not only a sign that was happening, but all commentators said this is a permanent and a resident part of the revelation of the Son of God. Wherever he is proclaimed, he will be spoken again, and all peoples that identify with him and follow him, this will be a resident effect of those people also because it's a part of the cost of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to Peter when he says these words to us from 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his gl uh, glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their party is evil spoken of, but on your party is glorified. But none of you suffers a murder, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. He says, if men speak evil of you and persecute you because of your righteous testimony before God, you know that the Spirit of God rests upon you, and that which is inspired is because of the devil who does not like that spirit that's moving through you. You stop the tape now, turn it over, and play the other side. Why well, don't blame it on God? But if you're living for God and you're living for Jesus, then you know that the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And this is a natural reaction because we are talking about something, a sign which shall be spoken again. We're talking about a deliberate target, dead aim that is taken on Jesus Christ, his gospel, all that assemble in true revelation and the preaching of his word, and all who identify with him will become a target for the slander of the devil and his crowd. If he wouldn't fight it, I wouldn't have it. And if religious people who are not preaching the word of God and who are not cleaving to the book are upset at what I'm doing. Thank God. Let them get more upset. I didn't come to make them happy. I came to preach the word and get people saved and disciple people for the kingdom of God. I'm not after any contact. I don't have any television program to support. I don't have any drums to beat. I don't have any reputation to, to defend. I didn't have any reputation since I, when I got saved. Amen. Praise God. 
And I don't have any now to defend. My business is to preach His Word. And my friend, this is the cost of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Hebrews about Moses and Moses who had tremendous opportunity to align with the culture and the society of his day. The Bible says he counted the, the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt and he identified with the people of God and by that identification he became a target just like all people of all time have been a target for the attacks of the devil from the pit. The contempt and the reproach Friend, that comes this morning of men that will come not only upon the Lord Jesus, but always upon his disciples is a mark of truth. It has always been so. He is a sign to be spoken against. And all that live for him, live godly in Christ Jesus, will suffer persecution, the Bible says, because one inherent uh, quality and factor of Jesus Christ is that they that stand for him will be a target of men's lives and slander and attack and deliberate twisting of their words and misunderstanding because that's a mark of those that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Saul is an interesting illustration of this very fact. Here is David. The kingdom has been taken. The dominion is gone. The anointing has departed from Saul. That anointing rests upon a young man named David who comes into residence in Saul's court. And the scripture says that Saul liked to play a little game, and that little game was dodge the arrow. And when David was there, all of a sudden Saul would have seizures of rage that came, we know by the divine revelation, by a spirit from the pit, an evil spirit that was troubling Saul because of his rebellion against God and because he would not obey the word of God. And so he had a little, a little uh, game that he played that's called step seize. Suddenly when David, or he thought David was not looking, Saul would grab the javelin and take dead aim. He wasn't just throwing that just to keep his arm in shape, friend. <laughs> oh, no. He was taking a shot at a man upon whom the Spirit of God rested that stirred something inside of him that he didn't fully understand or comprehend, but he'd take a shot at him, and he took dead aim at him. And the Scripture records some strange thing that on over he'd come to his senses and and uh, and and here would David be who'd never done him any harm uh, or who had never harmed him in any way and and he'd say David he said what's the, what's the matter with me I'm uh, and trying to kill you and and uh, I, I must have I must have flipped out and then the next day we'd find him right back on the trail trying to do him in and when his own son lined up with David and identified with David. The same thing happened and Saul picked up his javelin and took a shot at Jonathan when Jonathan identified with David because, my friend, one of the resident qualities of the Spirit of God that rests in man is when that Spirit rests in man, he becomes a target for the devil from the pit and the devil begins to fight it through people that will become instruments of his abuse and of his use. And so the cost of the gospel this morning means that you're not going to be liked by everybody and all men are not going to speak well of you and especially religious people are not going to like you. Thirdly, I conclude the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we start thinking about that, there's an immediate misconception that comes into human minds. Colossians says, The gospel is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you. Now when we say fruit, immediately in our minds as, uh, as individuals, we see uh, a basket, like one of those beautiful baskets that uh, some people have brought us at Christmas time, basket with full of pears and peaches and it's tied with a red ribbon and it's got saran wrap on it. Ooh, it's just luscious. And, and we would say, fruit, man, I like fruit. 
Or we say we can picture ourselves out in an orchard where luscious peaches are just hanging on the tree that we just pluck and put them in our mouth and the juice runs down our chin and say, wow, man, that's it. And so when we start thinking about fruit, well, immediately our minds trigger to that. But when we look into the gospel, we find that fruit picking is something completely different. Matter of fact, fruit picking in the gospel sometimes really becomes just that, fruit picking. Rising again of many. We're talking about a miracle. Not beautiful people. See, beautiful people don't need a miracle. We're talking about a miracle by the hand of God. The gospel, friend, the scripture declares that this gospel, when it is preached in that simplicity, we know that as it's preached that there are certain things that accompany it. We know that it is not brought to make people feel good. It's brought to make them, to make them a decision. Secondly, we know uh, this morning that that decision is something they're not going to like. We know that it's something that, that uh, brings repentance. But if they do, the Spirit of God rests upon them. And when the Spirit of God rests upon them, they become a deliberate target for the devil and his crowd and all who ignorantly obey what he is doing. But the Scripture says something happens this morning, and that which is happening is a rising again of many. A miracle transpires in the fruit that the gospel brings forth. I was uh, in a circumstance of uh, being in a situation with a leader of our organization recently, and we were talking about uh, some facets of, uh, of history and background. And this man made a comment which he didn't understand what he was fully saying, but I understood what he was saying. And he said, you talk about the good old days. The good old days, there weren't any good old days. He said, those days that you talk about, the good old days, were days when we were operating out of storefront buildings uh, and these congregations were just full of all kinds of people and tremendous turmoil. Those weren't good old days. Those were difficult days of pressure and turmoil and strife. That's right. That's what revival brings. And when he said that, he already noted to me what he was involved with, what he was saying is we like it better now because there's no problems, we're in beautiful buildings, we have no turmoil or strife, everything's smooth and everything goes religiously nice. But that's not what the gospel produces. See, that gospel fruit that's produced for preaching this book, friend, does not produce beautiful baskets full of, of saran-wrapped peaches and pears with red ribbons on it. It produces a wide variety of humanity. Lots of them are very close to being fruit. <laughs> Those were the good old days that he remembered when there used to be a lot of fruit picking. But now we just have an institution in many areas of ministry. See, the New Testament has some very unlikely candidates. Here's a demoniac of Gadarene. He's really a likely fella to plant churches in Decapolis. He's full of demons. He's got a legion of demons. He's running naked in the rocks in the caves, crying out, breaking every chain that they can put on him. He cuts himself. He's got a habit of taking stones and cutting himself. He's a beautiful picture. And here's a candidate to evangelize Decapolis, ten major cities. And yet that's the very person that Jesus Christ delivered from demons, and that's the man that evangelized Decapolis. John Ford is a tremendous little lady to start a citywide campaign with. She has moral problems. Her moral problems are so bad. She's ripped off so many ladies' husbands in that community that they will not allow her to even assemble as they go to draw water together. She has to come out by herself. And she's a likely candidate to evangelize a city and start a citywide campaign with, isn't she? And yet Jesus meets her 
ministers blessing and forgiveness and healing, she goes back and an entire city is won to the kingdom of God out of that unlikely candidate for the production of fruit in the kingdom of God. The rising again of many. We're talking about miracle ground. We're talking about God reaching down to desperate dregs of society, to people that are, are even non-functional, to people who of themselves are not appealing. We're not talking about beautiful people. We're talking about unlovely candidates for eternity. Now, I've got a firm conviction that is out of years of experience, unless a tremendous miracle compounded upon miracle compounded upon miracle upon miracle happens, uh, most religious people never come to that place where they will admit they really do need a tremendous work of God in their life, but they'll go on in their religious framework, but God reaches out to the demon-possessed. He reaches out to the morally troubled. He reaches down in life. Uh, the disciples, all except Judas, came out of, they, they were, religiously, they were hillbilly. They all came out of the Galilee, the hill country, and up in, in the Galilee area, and religiously, they were hillbillies. The only one that came out of the religious element of his, of his day was Judas, who betrayed him. The rest all were religious hillbillies. They were ignorant people concerning religious affairs. But when the gospel touched it, they were lifted from their sin and immediately became tremendous instrument of the power of God because they had an appreciation for things eternal. Because, my friend, uh, we're talking about the rising again of many. Most people who are just religious, there is no miracle has ever happened in their life. They're just religious. But occasionally some of these people will come and hear the gospel and that rock is confronting them, that rock cut out of a mountain, that stone cut out without hands, that breaks in pieces a nation. They will come and confront that. They will fall upon it and be broken in pieces and repent and rise again a new creation in Christ Jesus. But most religious people never, I don't know what I'm saying there. Boy, I'm getting to somebody and I'm, I'm zingooing somebody because I never have this in my, in my mind, but I'm laying it in and I'm not quitting until I get a verdict. <laughs> most religious people will not uh, let that happen to them, but the judgment of God comes upon them uh, and they are ground uh, unto powder because, my friend, the call of the gospel is to bring a rising again of many. And until you know how great a sinner you really are, you can never know the great salvation that God has wrought in Jesus Christ and his love. But you'll stand like the Pharisee. And the house of God, look at the publican beside you and uh, lift up your hand to God and say, God, I'm so thankful that I am who I am. Lord, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I go to church. I pray. I'm really a credit to you, Lord. Look how tremendous I am. I'm glad that I'm not like this Pharisee over here or like this publican over here, and God looks upon us and says, I reject you, I cannot accept you, because you are self-righteous until you see yourself exactly like that publican, lost and without hope, smiting on your chest, say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can do nothing for you until you come to that place, because, my friend, the gospel miracle is the rising again of many that will find themselves uh, in brokenness and humility and in repentance uh, and in contrition for their sin, sorry for the way they are and for the way they're living and willing to be lifted by God to become what they want to, they need to become. The aim of the gospel is redemption. Greatest danger in the kingdom of God is that people become know the phrases, they begin to know the language, they begin to know the techniques, they begin to know how they ought to act, but they are not in the redemptive uh, stream of God's flow because, my friend, redemption is God reaching down to lift people from their sin and iniquity and to establish them in the kingdom of God. And you and I, when we pass the capability to identify with the lost and the damned and those that are miserable and those that are in sin, when we lose that quality, we have lost the very thing that makes God's redemption effective in our generation. And it can happen before you know it that you begin to be proud of what you are, what you've achieved, and you forget that God simply wants to use you as a bridge through which he can bring a place to lift humanity under the kingdom of God. Can you say amen?
That is not compromise. That is not uh, watering down the gospel. That is simply staying in a place of, of, of contact with those that know not God to lift them from where they are unto an experience with Jesus Christ uh, through Calvary's miracle. Wherever, friend, there is no conviction in the services, wherever there is no reproach in a community upon a congregation, Wherever there are no visible demonstration of people being changed by the power of God, there is no real gospel being preached. For when this book is preached, in every service there will be conviction of sin. In every service, friend, there will be those who are there that have been drawn in by the Spirit of God, and there will be reproach that is upon an assembly upon the individual because of their identification with Jesus Christ. But thank God there will also be visible demonstration of people being saved and changed by the love and the grace of God that we can point to and say, here is this one. Here is that one. They've been changed by the power of God. This is a demonstration that God is alive in the earth today and still saving the souls of men. The gospel, wherever it is preached, friend, brings those three things. It brings conviction, it brings a reproach, and it brings visible demonstration of people that are being saved and lifted, and that's the price of revival. The pieces are palatable. There's no middle ground. There's no compromise. We cannot come to Jesus Christ and come out the same. We are, are broken in pieces, every man, or we're ground to powder, but there is no middle ground. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's moving around for a moment. Christians are seeking God softly. Hearts are open. God's love and grace ministers in this place. What a great love God has for the souls of men. What a great salvation he has wrought. Can you imagine that this day that here are beautiful people of all kinds in our, in our cities in America. They're religious. They have all the outward external effects of religion. They know how to dress. They know how to talk. They know how to act. They have religious outward external appearances. But, friend, it is not the beautiful people that become the instruments. Can you imagine what we're talking about this morning? A demoniac, insane, naked, so vile that he cannot assemble around people, is the candidate for tremendous evangelistic thrust. Church planter, evangelist. Here's a woman that is a detriment to an entire community. Her reputation is well known. She's so dangerous that the citizens of that city and society have shut her off because she's a scourge to the entire community. Jesus picks her. He had an appointment with her. He was up in another area of the country, and he said, I've got to take this road because I've got an appointment. I must needs go through Samaria, he said. He had an appointment with this woman because she was the instrument through which a citywide evangelistic crusade was going to be spearheaded. Here are fishermen, tax collectors, riffraff, revolutionaries. It's the common lot of all society. And these are the very ones that Jesus laid his hand upon and used and called them to discipleship and placed and invested in them the eternal redemption of an entire world as they carried the message of his death and for and, and uh, suffering on Calvary, shedding his blood for the souls of sinners, and 
rising from the dead as they carried that message out as emissaries and as ambassadors it was to bring redemption to an entire world and that he entrusted that to these people not beautiful people not religious people people that could be said of them rising again of many miracle ground in this building this morning there are people Maybe you've come to a realization of where you stand before God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There's none righteous, no, not one. Every single person needs a glorious miracle of God's salvation. And this morning you're sitting here, maybe you're a backslider, or maybe this morning you've never been touched by God's grace and love and conviction like your text this morning. He's in this building to do a work, a tremendous miracle in rising again of many. As you're here this morning, God's gripping your heart. I'm not asking you to join this church out of any kind of creed or embrace the big doctrine. I'm asking you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. He loves you. He is powerful to save. He is gracious in forgiveness. He will forgive any sin. The vilest sin, the vilest sinner, he will receive. And the vilest sin, he will cleanse and forgive and deliver from. 